Welcome to The Book Podcast, where we discuss books about the book, the Bible, with your hosts, Scott Moffitt, Gabriel Penfield, and Gary Karwaski. We go as deep as we can go, look as hard as we can look, as we only scratch the surface of the meaning of the book. We only scratch the surface of the meaning of the book. Hello, welcome to the podcast number 16 of the book. Today, we interview a man who has written a comprehensive book that covers the full scope of prophecy in scripture. I believe it is of utmost importance that we understand what the Bible teaches about the future events that are coming so that we can prepare ourselves and others for it. Our guest is author, Dr. Paul Benware. He's been a professor, a theologian, a preacher, a conference speaker, and an author, and he's been very busy. He earned his BA from Los Angeles Bible College, a THM from Dallas Seminary, and a THD from Grace Seminary. He has written 10 books, including Understanding End Times Prophecy, which we examine today, The Believer's Payday, The Surveys, Surveys of both Old and New Testament, and his most recent books include Daniel, God's Man with God's Message, and Understanding the Book of Hebrews. He has also been a contributor to a number of other books, as well as published journal and magazine articles. Paul's passion is for the church. He is committed to teaching the inspired word of God with a focus on biblical prophecy. He has traveled extensively in the United States and around the world. He has served as a professor of Bible at Arizona Christian University, Philadelphia College of the Bible, Los Angeles Bible excuse me, Los Angeles Baptist College and the Moody Bible Institute of Chicago. He and his wife, Anne, live in Litchfield Park, Arizona. They have successfully raised four children and presently have eight grandchildren, unless that's changed. Paul, how long have you and Anne been married? Well, you know, we just uh, turned 59 years uh, last week. That is a long time. Congratulations. It is a long time, yeah. We, We look at it and can't believe that we've we've lasted that long, but it's it's been great. Yeah, and that's your first wife, right? <laughs> it, it, it's right. It's, Praise God. It's <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> well, well, we're going to begin our time together by asking a question I ask all our authors. Why did you write this book? Well, you know, I was in the classroom for many years, and what I discovered as I tried to find textbooks uh, it was true of the survey books. Uh, it was true also of understanding end times prophecy. And that is that a lot of books either are so lean that you don't really come away with enough. And then there are some books that are so thick that it just got so much detail. And so uh, really the book was born out of what I sense to be the um, uh, needs of, of my college students. You're holding up the re, the the older, older version, version. Mm-hmm. yeah. So it, it was really born out of the the what I observed in the classroom as I tried to find books, and finally came to the conclusion: well, what if I what if I wrote one uh, for my own students? And uh, that's kind of the way it turned out. Hmm. I read your other book called uh, "The Believer's Payday." Well, one of your Tucker. other books, a wonderful book on rewards. And it had the same thing that this book does. It began with a very pastoral tone. You state that one of the purposes of prophecy is to encourage people. Let me ask you, how does prophecy do that? And why don't we see more pastors doing it today? Well, you know, it's a, it's a very good question because I've had pastors tell me that they stay away from prophecy. And yet when you see how the Lord Jesus himself and the apostles, they, they blended uh, prophetic themes in with their various teachings, because um, the, the, the way in which we live well in this world, the way I think our sanctification um, proceeds along nicely, is when we have a two-world view. A two-world view is living in this world with an eye on the world to come. I mean, that basically is was Paul's sure. philosophy in Philippians 3. And when people don't have that, 
I mean, if this world is all they have, uh, we see today incredible despair, hopelessness, the upswing in suicides. If this is it, then this is a major disappointment. But prophecy tells us otherwise. It gives us hope. It gives us uh, the ability to make decisions differently, prioritize life differently. Prophecy is very, very critical uh, to, I think, the Christian life today. I tell my students. Go ahead. I'll just say, I'll I'll finish. I I tell my students that prophecy was written primarily to change the way we live today, Hmm. not to satisfy our curiosities about future events. Yeah, my comment was, I find that the pastors that don't deal with prophecy do so for three major reasons. Uh, One, they don't think it's important. Uh, Two, they think it's too divisive. And three, they don't even have a position themselves. Hmm. So it seems seems to me that those are, are, they're not good reasons, but there are the reasons that I hear. Yeah, well, I think that I hear the same kinds of things. Um, And it's unfortunate because uh, the scriptures themselves testify the importance of biblical prophecy. Yeah. Chapter one focuses on the importance of a literal hermeneutic at DTS, which three of us are graduates from it had a, it had a focus on the literal grammatical, historical contextual hermeneutic. And in fact, it was drilled into our heads. Oh yeah. Why is holding a proper hermeneutic so important to the interpretation of prophecy? Well, simply because, uh, the scriptures become the final authority. Once you begin to to drift into the area of spiritualization or allegorization, where you see that the literal interpretation is is not telling you the the deep story, uh, when you allegorize, the interpreter becomes the final authority. Literal interpretation, the Bible is the final authority, mm-hmm. and there is a huge difference between those two approaches. As a result. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you get two different approaches, and oftentimes you you explain it with the analogy of, hey, you have two different airplanes. They're in the same airport. They're right next to each other. You get on one, it might be going to Los Angeles. The other one might be going to Virginia, where I live, or New York, right? Two different places, and you got to decide which one you go on. Um, chapter two, you yeah. talk about the Abrahamic covenant. You state, you state that it's a foundation to a proper understanding of biblical prophecy, and it begins with the covenants. So can you give an explanation of the Abrahamic covenant and then also how the future covenants kind of relate back into the Abrahamic covenant? Can you give a little overview on that? Uh, We'll try. That's uh, I tell my students that uh, the Abrahamic covenant is the glue that holds the Bible together. Mm. So what you're asking me to do now is to tell the whole Bible story. Well, (laughs) Well, you compared it to a puzzle and the outline of the puzzle. puzzle Yes. Well, um, the the Abrahamic covenant is God's on oath commitment to restore everything that was lost in Eden, and he chose to use Abraham. We we don't have any real understanding why he chose Abraham. I have a friend who thinks that God should have chosen the Italians, which I don't think, I don't think was a great idea. But anyway, God decided. <laughs> exactly. God decided to use Abraham, and. Um, <clears throat> The, the, and then as the time went on, he developed uh, promises to uh, the nation of Israel through Isaac and Jacob, a land area, a king, uh, and eventually uh, a covenant which would bring about the salvation of mankind, the new covenant. When you fast forward to the, um, um, the time of Christ, uh, aside from the promises given to Abraham personally and also to David personally, uh, this covenant has not been fulfilled. Uh, nothing has been fulfilled. And so it was in going to be in the Lord Jesus. And uh, the nation of Israel chose to reject everything that he presented. But um, God did not set aside Israel. He, he condemned that generation of Israel. But uh, God made a promise to Israel. And he is going to fulfill those promises. And so why do we have to, uh, why do we believe in a in a uh, messianic age, a millennial kingdom, as we call it, for one reason only, and that is the promises that God made are not fulfilled yet. Mm-hmm. So the Abrahamic covenant, starting with Genesis 12, all the way through Genesis, uh, Revelation 22, uh, it, you, you see the, the theme of um, 
uh, the Abrahamic covenant everywhere. Mm-hmm. So that is the covenant that forms the framework I, for biblical prophecy. So <clears throat> I don't know if you have any follow-up uh, points on that, but that mm-hmm. really is just the big picture. But what God is doing in the in the story using Israel, he is set about, instead of, you know, you think about back in Genesis 3, God could have destroyed everything mm-hmm. and started over again. You know, what would he have lost? Two people, seven days work. Mm-hmm. But you incinerate it all, and seven days later, you can be up, up and running with, you know, Fred and Martha instead of uh, Adam and Eve. So he didn't do that. He decided to restore and reconcile everything that was lost. And he chose finally to do it through Abraham. And, uh, of course, then through Abraham's great son, uh, the Lord Jesus himself. Yeah. And uh, so that's where we're headed. Yeah. All right. So we're talking about a lot about covenants and sub covenants that were passed on to Isaac and Jacob and eventually all the way through Christ. Um, is that the same as covenant theology? Mm-hmm. No, people do get confused. <laughs> That's but right. A covenant theology is really a theological system uh, using covenantal language, which appears to give it, I think, substance and validity, but it is really uh, constructed not from exegesis of the scripture, but it comes out of, you know, theological ideas. And so um, you have, you know, the various covenants of redemption and grace and so on, uh, but those are not the biblical covenants. And that's one of the things I find that my students, if they have any knowledge of covenants, come into class somewhat confused about. The biblical covenants and the theological covenants are, are worlds apart. So that's where the idea of the two planes came in that Gabe mentioned, getting yeah. on one plane with the covenantal uh, the- theological approach to prophecy or dispensational approach. Right. They're going to take you in two completely different ways. Can I ask a quick question right. about that? The first, I mean, people accuse dispensationalists of kind of putting the dispensationalists, usually seven part um, dispensations on scripture, right? But then a lot of covenantalists, and I want to get your opinion on it. They put in the covenant of redemption, right? Or maybe they come from grace, but a lot of them do do the covenant of redemption. Can you explain a little bit on what the covenant of redemption is? Go a little bit deeper than maybe what was in the book? Well, I'm not sure I could uh, get get to that for a moment here. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to check. I don't remember exactly what I put in the book, frankly, at this point. But... um, Well, the, the covenant of redemption would be a covenant that made between the Godhead from eternity past. Mm-hmm. Um, that's their idea. And then the covenant of works is uh, God's covenant with Adam before the fall. But the overriding covenant is the covenant of grace. And um, there you mm-hmm. actually have with some covenant theologians, they see the same kind of distinctions that dispensationalism says. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, the, the difference, of course, is that there's a soteriological emphasis where you have um, uh, everybody, uh, whether you're Jew or Gentile, um, old dispensation or new dispensation, you are saved. And that becomes the kind of the glue of uh, covenant theology. But then, and then uh, the key in there is Israel. Um, now becomes the church now becomes the new israel and so that's that's their comprehensive uh, approach to it all yeah and that just three or one second but that that just shows that there is a difference right it's this isn't just semantics where maybe we're just we just have the same opinion it's just wording there is a difference and there's difference in opinions and i like how you kind of show that and make it clear well those those three the covenant let me ask you this then you can comment the gr- covenant of grace, redemption, and works are all made outside of Scripture by the Godhead before the creation begins. Is, that's my understanding. Is that correct? They sort of agree with one another. Jesus is going to die for the sins of mankind, but it's before the creation right. begins. Right. Right. Yeah. And but again, it it um, dispensational theology flows out of just a common reading of the text of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Um, These are not ideas imposed on the Scriptures, where uh, my sense is that uh, in covenant theology, they have 
um, constructed a system and everything is going to be pushed into that system in one way or another. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing that bothers me the most now is that you've, um, in covenant theology, you basically have negated the biblical covenants because you've now set Israel aside, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, the, the church is now the new Israel. Mm-hmm. And that, of course, is without, I think, good exegetical basis at all. I would love to spend a lot more time on soteriology, uh, especially if we talk about Old Testament salvation, New Testament salvation, tribulation salvation. I'd like to move on to something else. There are no, Gary, of- we're not moving on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I got like tons of questions here, buddy. So answer. Go, I, question, I, go. I got I'm thinking about the isms. I think people really don't comprehend. Our listeners don't really grasp. What's the difference? Amillennialism, post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, all millennialism, whatever it is. Um, let's get a let's get a good definition of those three belief systems and talk about especially why amillennialism is probably the most uh, believed of the three. Hmm. Well, let's start with what I think is the correct approach, which is pre millennialism. Uh, Premillennialism comes out of a literal, normal reading of the scriptures. In fact, um, an amillennialist or two um, will tell you that if you take the scriptures literally, you'll end up premillennial, which is quite an admission. So the idea of premillennialism is simply that Jesus Christ comes before the millennium, which uh, that's the term we're stuck with. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's really the messianic age. Um, the term millennium, meaning a thousand years, uh, simply is um, uh, comes out of Revelation 20. It's important that that's John's contribution, that it's the length of the, me- of the messianic age is a thousand years, which, by the way, uh, needs to be taken literally and normally. Uh, it's a thousand years. It doesn't stand for anything else. Um, numbers aren't used in a in a uh, spiritualized sense at the Book of Revelation. Anyway, um, so it's a the the thing about my complaint about the term millennial is that it doesn't communicate all the Old Testament truth about what the messianic age is like. So we're stuck with it, but it's the idea is that Jesus comes back before to the earth and establishes his kingdom on the earth. As uh, Matthew 25 says, he comes back, he will sit on his glorious throne, and then he will judge the nations, and then you have the establishment of his kingdom. All millennialism, the little letter A is a negative, and it simply means no millennium. And that, again, is an unfortunate term because an amillennialist does believe in a millennium or a kingdom reign of Christ. It just, it's um, not for a thousand years. It turns out it started with the first coming of Christ, um, and it will continue until the second coming. So we are in the kingdom reign of Christ now, which, of course, means that uh, he's reigning from heaven. Um but that defies the Old Testament prophets. I've always said to my students, if this is, uh, um, don't want to be sacrilegious students, but if this is the best Jesus could do right now, I'm, I deeply am disappointed yeah. because I don't see righteousness. I don't mm-hmm. see peace. I don't see joy, which is the uh, all-consuming atmosphere of Messiah's kingdom. Those don't exist. And so all millennialism means no earthly kingdom. No kingdom on this earth, which goes against um, uh, numerous passages, for sure. Postmillennialism looks much like amillennialism it, with one wrinkle or so of difference, and that is that the age is going to get better and better and better and better and better, and then we kind of usher in the second coming of Christ. The church kind of cleans up the earth for him, and he comes back then as... Um, uh, at the end of the millennium. And we're not doing a good of, job of that. 
No, no. I'm I'm afraid we're losing ground on that one. I'm afraid so. <laughs> but but millennium, all millennials, the majority view because, um, in my judgment, uh, that the churches that came out of the Reformation, um. Uh, were basically all millennial because the Roman Catholic Church was all millennial. And reformers like a Luther and so on, their great issue was the issue of salvation, the issue of the church, uh, not so much the issue of future things. So in, in their, fo- their focus was not on prophecy. It wasn't on eschatology. So they just kind of took the furniture of the Roman Catholic Church with them on that particular subject. Yeah. That's why mm-hmm. I think it nominates and uh, Protestantism today. Hmm. Um, well, Gary kind of skipped over this. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I know. He's he's always doing that. Um, why <laughs> is the idea or understanding of the seed of Abraham very important to understanding the Abrahamic covenant? Could you just explain a little bit of that for us? Most people don't understand it, I don't think. Well, you know, there are uh, these the, it, related to the covenant. It's it is the physical seed of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. There is indeed, according to Paul in Galatians, a spiritual seed because Abraham is our is our father spiritually. We are people of faith. Uh, Abraham was a man of faith within Israel. Paul explains that there is the the um, seed of Abraham, the physical line. And then there are some Israelites who are also the spiritual children of Abraham, but not all of them. In fact, didn't Jesus say to the Pharisees in John 8, uh, you are of your father the devil, which was a surprise to them to hear that, that they are not uh, children of Abraham, not as Jesus was thinking. So, uh, But the, the, um, the Abrahamic covenant, God's commitment was to the physical descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. That's the physical line. Israel. There is a yeah, right, the nation of Israel, and uh, those are the promises that he gave was to physical, uh, national, ethnic, the bloodline of, of Abraham. That's the covenant that was made, and I think it's very important. Um, when I do Galatians with my students, we emphasize a lot of Galatians chapter three, where Paul makes it clear that once a covenant has been ratified. You can't change it. Mm-hmm. He says that's true of man's covenants. So that today, if we buy a house and we go to the bank and we agree on a certain monthly payment, certain percentage for a certain period of time, nobody can change that. Now you can you could get rid of it and get a new mortgage, but you can't change that one. The you government's not going to pay for it. Nope. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> but the. the and so the idea that God somehow is now going to transfer, going to change the parties of the covenant mm-hmm. from the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob to what is primarily a Gentile um, organization, the Church of Jesus Christ, Paul says it cannot be done. Mm-hmm. And I have not a good, seen a good discussion, maybe you guys have, from a replacement theologian explaining the Galatians 3 passage, that you don't change a ratified covenant. And the the Abrahamic covenant was ratified by blood, as we know in Genesis uh, 15, with the sacrificing of the animals there. Well, you can't change the parties and you can't change the provisions of a ratified covenant. Paul can't be any clearer. And I think that's a challenge for anybody who says the church is now the new Israel because what you deal the deal was made with Israel, but they want to change it, include the church. Right. And that's a no, no, according to Paul in Galatians three. Yeah. And I, I'm going to take his word for it on this matter. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. In one way they try to get around that is by making the Abraham, a covenant um, conditional. Right, they try to make it Abraham comic covenant. Abraham had to do something, or Abraham's descendants have to do something. Can you explain why the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional, and why that's different than the Mosaic covenant, which is conditional? Can you explain that? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. The Mosaic covenant was the usual kind of covenant. That is, it was a conditional covenant. You do this, and then I will do that. 
And I don't think that there's any conditions attached to the Abrahamic covenant. Some would say, well, he had to get over to Canaan from Ur of the Chaldees. But even if that was the case, the point is he arrived in Ur of, in Canaan. And from that point on, it was God's always saying that he was going to do certain things. And uh, when, you, when you look at um, the developments of the various covenants, uh, as an example, uh, you go to uh, the new covenant flowing out when God said, I'm going to, in you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That would be the covenant that deals with the core issue of the salvation of mankind. It would be through a Jew, but it would be for all nations. But when you look at the the, the first revelation of it in um, uh, Jeremiah 31, just get out your pen and notice how often God says, I will, I will, I will. This is That's an unconditional covenant. I will do this. It's not we are going to do this together. And so you look at the Davidic covenant in Psalm 89, same thing. God says on oath, I am going to do these things. And so it is God's commitment to the fact that he is going to do these things. Uh, no conditions given to Abraham or Abraham's descendants. Yeah, quick insertion here. I've always told my people, when God says, I will, he does. That's right. Can we exactly give Gabe right. a test? He's the youngest here. Can we give him a test? A covenant is a promise, right? So, Gabe, what are the three promises made in the Abrahamic covenant to Israel? All right. You got the promise of seed or descendants. You got the promise of land. And you get the promise of blessing. Those are the three? Yes. yes. And so, Dr. Um, Ben Ware, that's your name. <laughs> yeah. Let me check my name tag here. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> so you, you talked, and I and I thought it was really important about the sub covenants. Yeah. Can you explain it? So there's a one big one, and then there's these sub covenants. Mm. Well, what well, I call them that because what they are the developments of God, what God gave an embryo form to Abraham. Um, so in other words. Uh, he was told, Abraham was told that he had land. But as the Old Testament develops, you learn more of the issues, the conditions, the borders, that kind of thing. Um, he, he talks about the king. You know, kings are going to come forth from you. Well, you know, time marches on almost a thousand years until we arrive at the time of David. And then mm -hmm. we have clarification. The, the Davidic covenant develops, it explains the um the the fact that the king is going to come a king is coming from Abraham same holds true with blessing um, somehow in some way uh, God's got to deal with what happened back in Eden and that is solved by of course the death of our Lord Jesus on the cross and um, <clears throat> you know he then develops that in uh, particularly starting in Jeremiah Ezekiel picks it up and of course. Um, you come into the New Testament times where, um, so in embryo form, seed form, this information was, uh, the basics were given to Abraham, but later developed uh, in these three uh, covenantal uh, developments, uh, the sub-covenants as I call them. There you go. Yeah, in dispensationalism, we believe that um, the way of, way of salvation was the same in every single dispensation. So just a quick question. Um, you might not know what you might not know what covenantalists um, they believe. Do they believe in a different way of salvation for Adam and Eve? Do they believe that that was salvation through works, or uh, just something I'm wondering right now? Do you know that? I, I really don't because I'm not really clear okay. on on what on what they think happened with Adam and Eve in the covenant of works. I mean, the idea was apparently that they were required to do certain things, but you know, you're probably dealing with a very, very brief, uh, maybe a few days or a few weeks. Yeah. And so there's just not a whole lot given there. And they're not clear about it, as mm -hmm. I recall in reading them. And just a quick question. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, something that you repeat often throughout the book. And by the way, just to, to interject here, as I was reading through this book, I thought, this is no doubt the most comprehensive book I've ever <laughs> read on prophecy. I mean, you cover everything i just i don't can't think of anything that you left out it just i was amazed 
<laughs> so that's just a little comment on the side. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> but I, I have thought of some things that I left out, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, you know, you even say sometimes, well, I'd like to spend more time on this, but this is all all the time we have for it. Yeah. Um, you meant, one of the things you mentioned over and over again is this whole aspect of spiritualizing, uh, allegory, allegorizing the text uh, to that leads interpreters astray, that literalism is central to the right understanding of scripture. Let's, since you emphasize it so much throughout the book, let's go ahead and speak to that at this point. Okay. What uh, was why, is, okay. why is literalism so important? That's all we got to say. That's all there is to it. No, <laughs> that's right. Maybe I just said it all. <laughs> well, you know, I, um, when you approach the, the scriptures literally, um, what you do is to you sort of set up a fence, uh, a perimeter, a parameter around your 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 interpretation, um, which which keeps you from wandering into speculation. Um, Mm-hmm. And um, uh, keeps you really uh, probably uh, with the ass- <laughs> let me back up. It's just the assumption that God who's trying to communicate truth uh, is going to do it through normal language. The problem that the person has who uh, spiritualizes is that um, it, it really becomes their opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and you look at the way that the book of Revelation is approached, and if you're spiritualizing or allegorizing the text, um, you can come up with, you know, uh, as I think I use the illustration, uh, the, in the, one of the, the sixth trumpet judgment, is it, that uh, you have I'm a commentator, you yeah, know, that that's going to be the, the invasion of the Goths and the Huns in 300 A.D., Right. And my question is, why couldn't that be the Vietnamese War? Mm-hmm. Or how about World War II? You know, where in the world mm-hmm. you come up with that kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. It is solely in the mind of the interpreter. But that's exactly where spiritualization and allegorization leads you, is that there is, there is no anchor for you. And, you, and that's why... Um, historicists, those who see the book of Revelation as a, a picture of history um, between first and second coming, why they can come up with the most bizarre interpretations. Oh, yeah. And you can get five guys who are historicists, and they have five completely different understandings. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you might as well just bury the book of Revelation because it's now become useless. Literal interpretation keeps you on track and keeps you focused on what the text is saying. And you don't have the liberty to go anywhere you want with it. And so <clears throat> I think that is the great problem with allegorization and why um, the, the literal, normal, grammatical, historical approach is the only one that leads you to a, a proper understanding of what the Bible says. Yeah. One quick, one quick thing. Um, I was talking with somebody today um, about, he, he used to be a Jehovah witness and right now he's, he's kind of more of a postmodern. It, it wasn't me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, a, it was a grand guy. We're in New York city, kind of just talking with people. He was Jehovah witness and he used to, he used to believe in that, but now he's more postmodern. There is no truth, but he, I was talking to him. I was going to show him a verse in revelation, right? The lake of fire he brought up that God's loving, God's forgiving. And I was like, yeah, God is loving, God is forgiving, but God's also just. So I was going to show him in Revelation, hey, the lake of fire. But then he's like, no, 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 no. Revelation's an allegory, right? Revelation's not literal. You can't take it. And that's the problem is that when you when you don't take Revelation literally, you, you throw Revelation and other verses off as allegories, you, ha- you have problems with doctrine, right? You don't believe God's a just God. You don't believe in God's wrath. You believe that God's just loving. He loves everybody. There's no hell, right? Your, your basic understanding of scripture changes if you take things not literally, but as allegories. Isn't that the yeah. biggest thing that's thrown at uh, dispensationalists is that there are images in the Bible, there are figures that are used, and we can't take those literally like the whore uh, riding the beast, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we do. We do believe in, in figures of speech. Yeah. Obviously. obviously. Mm-hmm. You know, 
And, and the, the whole idea that literalism somehow excludes metaphors, figures of speech, that type of thing, is, is really um, a straw man. That's not what literalism uh, uh, believes in. The problem people have with Revelation is that they fail to recognize that most all of the imagery in Revelation comes out of the Old Testament. It already has a fixed meaning to it. Right. And and so, uh, you know, you look at, um, at John's uh, uh, use of figures of speech. He didn't make up most of those. You know, they, they come out of the Old Testament, and it is our ignorance of the Old Testament mm -hmm. which leads us to all these uh, rather strange interpretations that we see on the Internet all the time these days. Yep. Or in Gary's preaching. <laughs> could be. Oh, it could be, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, are you going to ask a question or do you want me to? Uh, go for it. I got another one coming up. In 1 Corinthians 10, 32, we find a critical verse, which explains a lot about uh, people. Can you, you know, that's the one about, uh, it's, a, it's a central idea in dispensationalism that there's just not two people, two oh, kinds okay. of people. Let's read it. Give no offense either to the Jews or the Greeks or the church of God. Okay. Yep, those would be the, um, the basic three categories of mankind in this particular age. Mm -hmm. You have... Um, so what does that argue against? Well, it... Uh, Probably, are, I'm not sure where you're leaning on this. Well, one. you know that the the covenantalists will say that um, the church is the new Israel. Yeah, but it can't be if Paul says you have three different kinds of people existing. Right, you have the church, you have Israel, and you have uh, what was the other one? I've already Greeks. forgotten. Greeks, Greeks. Gentiles, Gentiles. Greeks. Mm -hmm. unsaved Greeks, unsaved Jews, and mm -hmm. you have the Church of God. Yeah, those are the. The three basic categories. So we can't be the new Israel if Israel still exists alongside us and the Greeks, the church yeah. and the Greeks. Yeah. And it's interesting that that distinction somehow goes all the way through eternity. You know, you look at the new Jerusalem and there's the 12 foundation stones named after the apostles, the 12 gates into the city named after the 12 tribes of Israel. So even in eternity, there's a, a kind of distinction Separation. that's still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's still there. Yeah, so um, a quick question. Um, you talk about amillennialism, right, in, in one of your chapters, and that uh -huh. the kingdom's now. So is Jesus the king of the church, or is he just, or is he lord of the church? Are we members of the kingdom of God, or are we servants of the king in his kingdom? How is that, how is that different? Well, you know, I suppose it depends upon who you're talking to, but the idea of the kingdom of God is, uh, which is used several hundred times in the Bible, is simply the rule of God over whatever is in the context. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the church of Jesus Christ would be seen uh, as, um, by, the, by the amillennial, uh, as, a, as the rule of Christ. Uh, today over mm -hmm. yeah it's the the it is the church um can i give a little context to that i think what gabe is driving at is that jesus came and offered himself to be the king of the jews and promised them a thousand year you know that the millennial kingdom would come is are we building the kingdom now as christians or are we building as my assumption is we're building the church and if that is so, is there a difference in what happens in the millennium? Are we all part of the kingdom of God? Or, uh, you know, I would contend that maybe the church is servants of God in the kingdom and administering that kingdom. Or, you know, how do you see that 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 picture? Well, um, if I could unravel what you're saying, the, the you need um, to. Yeah, <laughs> the the kingdom of God has uh, different phases to it. I mean, there is, uh, you look at the Psalms, the universal kingdom of God, which includes right. everybody and everything, because God is king of his own universe. The millennial kingdom is um, is when the son of David 
uh, rules over all of mankind, um, peculiarly uh, over Israel as well. But Psalm 2 is very clear that the nations of the earth are the inheritance of the Son, whom God has already established as king on Mount Zion, which is an interesting statement because as far as the Father's concerned, it's a done deal already. So <clears throat> there is an aspect of the rule of God now, uh, several aspects of it, as, um, and depending upon what the context of the scriptures are. But as far as the, uh, the future kingdom of God, you know, the, there is the thousand-year reign of Christ, and the marriage of the Lamb occurs in, the, in heaven. So the church is married to Christ, Revelation 19. We then return with him to the earth, which I see as the great marriage supper of the Lamb. Mm. And beyond that, we aren't told a whole lot about what the um, um, uh, relationship of the church to the king, millennial kingdom is. We do know that um, there is going to be rulership. Um, there's going to be levels of government. Uh, Peter wanted to know, we've given everything to follow you. What's in it for us? And Jesus said, good question. Uh, you're going to rule over 12 tribes of Israel. So under Messiah will be David, I think. And under David will be the 12 apostles. So there is some link. Uh, in the Messianic kingdom between the church and Israel, the, the apostles are present. Um, and when Jesus comes back, he talks about giving rulership authority uh, to various ones. So we don't know exactly what the structure will be, but we do know that there is a structure uh, to the kingdom, which will probably be uh, put in place during the uh, period of time uh, between the second coming and the actual inauguration of the kingdom. I think there is a, a period of time in there of um, 70 days. I keep asking we, these questions when we have authors on it. I can't get a clear answer. Jesus is said to be the king of Israel, not the king of the church. Right. He is the Lord of the church. So I get it. When we go into the millennial kingdom, I believe, isn't that, Jesus' reign over Israel? Isn't the tribulation all about bringing Israel to Jesus himself? How does the church play into that? I, he's not my king. He's my Lord and my Savior. And I think that's where a lot of Christians get really screwed up, especially when it comes to interpreting the Gospels. They're always applying everything in the Gospel, everything salvific in the Gospels, when in actuality, right. almost 95% or 99% of it is not. Yeah. Well. Um, the book of I John is this, the book of John is uh, you're, you're going to talk about the synaptics. Yeah. That's another yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I, it frustrates I, I, me. He is the, <laughs> I can tell. I can, I can tell. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. But, yeah. He, he is the king of Israel because mm -hmm. he's fulfilling the Davidic covenant. But his inheritance is going to be all the nations of the earth. And so uh, I agree with you that the purpose, the primary purpose of the tribulation period is to bring Israel back to himself. And Israel will then actually be doing more of what they're supposed to be doing. And that is being the light to the Gentiles. And I see, you know, this is the greatest time of salvation in human history. Millions and millions of people come to faith during that period of time. And he is king and he is Lord both. But he is, you're right, he is, um, he's never designated as king of the church. He mm -hmm. is designated as the Lord, and mm -hmm. he will be king over everything, mm -hmm. all the nations of the earth. And we would, of course, be included in that. But, but how the bride fits in is of, of great interest to me, and I don't know how much uh, we really know about that aspect of what the kingdom will be like wouldn't that make us the queen of the church <laughs> <laughs> i mean we're married to the king right yeah well i'm not uh, uh, be, qu be careful about the queen of heaven yeah stuff. i know that's, you're that's, that's that's not, that's not, that's that's not really good um, All right. let, gary let me, let me go to uh, back up to the tribulation then mm -hmm. so okay. we have a number of views about the rapture 
Uh -huh. And um, we believe that the tribulation is the 70th week of Daniel. Right. Primarily dealing with uh, primarily dealing with the Jews. Scott mentioned it. It's to its purpose is to get Israel saved so they can enter into the millennium. Romans 11, yeah. all Israel will be saved. Um, right. Let's talk about that a little bit, because there's some people who think that the rapture and the second coming are basically the same event. Mm -hmm. Let's separate those for us. Well, um, for starters, Revelation 19 needs to be looked at very carefully, because no matter how you slice the thing, the church is seen for the very first time in heaven um, in preparation for the marriage of the Lamb, and you see that she is wearing bright garments, you know, bright and clean, uh, which are the righteous acts of the saints, which means that the church has gone through the time of what we call the judgment seat of Christ. So you have these two major events of the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage of the Lamb prior to the second coming of Christ to the earth. This is a huge problem. Revelation 19 is a huge problem for the post-millennialist or oh, yeah. post-tribulationalist because you can't have Jesus going up, us beating him in the air like an elevator and coming right back down to earth again. You have these two major significant events uh, which must take place. So the whole, to me, the we who hold to a pre-tribulational view that is, the church is taken out of the earth prior to uh, the tribulation period. Uh, there's a lot of lines of evidence, but one that I would uh, probably uh, emphasize is that really all rapture views agree on this point, and that is that um, the church of Jesus Christ, the bride, is exempt from the wrath of God based upon 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1 Thessalonians 5. And so, uh, if you can demonstrate that the entire seven-year period is, in fact, the wrath of God, you have compelling reasons for the church being taken out prior to that. And when you look at Revelation 6 and the initial judgments of um, the tribulation period, mm -hmm. you see that um, John specifically says in the fourth one about famines wars, wild beasts of the earth. That's not and, wrath. <laughs> yeah. And you go back to the Old Testament, and lo and behold, what do you find? Mm -hmm. Dozens, not one, but dozens mm -hmm. of passage which define the wrath of God in, in, the, ter in the term of those four the things. Same ones. Wow. Wow. The same ones. Wow. Yeah. And so that's not, some, that's not an accident, and also mm -hmm. that simply underscores um, the fact that we are unfortunately fairly illiterate when it comes to the Old Testament prophets, you know, as believers in the church today, and we don't recognize um, the the Old Testament prophets everywhere in the Book of Revelation. But if you have the wrath of God from the very beginning, that is strong and compelling reasons uh, for. Um, uh, the tribulation, uh, the rapture occurring before the tribulation. And and then the fact that, uh, you know, Jesus is the one breaking the seals. There you go. Begin the judgment. Yeah. These are divine judgments. And so when you start talking, as some groups do, oh, well, that the first part is the wrath of Satan or the wrath of man. Wait a minute. Go back to uh, Revelation 4, 5, and 6. What do you discover? The scroll has been given to Jesus, the only one who has the authority to do this. He is the one who breaks the seals. These are divine judgments, mm. not yeah. judgments of men. God uses various means, granted, but these are divine judgments. I've never heard anybody go back to the Old Testament and find those exact seals in the Old Testament as God's wrath. And that's and that that's great. And <laughs> that really solidifies that point. So what I'm hearing and kind of summing it up from what I'm hearing from you is that you have to go to the Old Testament to understand prophecy. You can't take yeah. a look at Revelation and understand it by itself. You have to go to the Old Testament. And oftentimes the church focuses just on the New Testament rather than the Old Testament. 
So, yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And, um, you know, I, it's been my experience in the, you know, having the privilege of teaching college students over the years is that the college students that I used to get were far more biblically literate than mm -hmm. the ones today, which has it. a lot to do with what happens in the home and what happens in the church. I think the students today love the Lord as much. They want to serve him as much, but they are coming in less prepared. Uh, as far as biblical knowledge, and that goes back to the training that they apparently are not getting um, in the church setting or even at home. Yep. Yeah, I had I recently had a conversation with someone in my church who did say that the uh, first half of the tribulation was the wrath of man, and he brought up uh, the four horsemen, and I let him know that here's how I explained it. I don't know if this will help. I said God often uses nations to punish. Uh, to Israel, for example, you could say that uh, the 722 was the wrath of the Assyrians, but no, it was the wrath of God. God was using the Assyrians. You could say the wrath of 586 against Israel was the Babylonians, but no, God was using the Babylonians to, you know, to, to form right. his wrath on Israel. So it's just God right. uses other people. You said it. That's it. Yeah. And, and I do think that um, your point is well taken. And remember how Habakkuk struggled. Uh, with the whole thing of God using Babylon, you know, why don't you judge Israel? They're wicked. Oh, I think I will. I'll use Babylon. Wait a minute. They're worse than we are. You know, back it <laughs> says, but the point is well taken that that was his instrument of judgment. It was God's judgment, but it was Babylon that he used. Are you opening the door, Gabe, and knocking? Is someone knocking at the door? Come out. Is it, come is out. It the Lord, is the Lord knocking at the door? Come out and perfect stop with segue. us. <laughs> No, I have a question. There are three essentials. I, I remember this from Pentecost class uh, to having a kingdom, a ruler, a realm of subjects and exercise of authority over those subjects. And I find those in your book as well. Yeah. Um, does that eradicate the idea that God is reigning within us now? You know, he's in our hearts kind of type thing. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure it, it, it removes it entirely. No, I mean he is he is the uh, to be the Lord, and we are his subjects. But there's no physical land, and there's no rules in the sense that um, he's ruling over his realm and, and with a, a rod of iron kind of type thing. Where you know the the what is it, Gary? The here but not yet type of idea. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. our uh, progressive dispensationalist friends. Right, right. Well, yeah, I, I don't know that I, I quite bring it to that level, but you could, I suppose, because we are we would be the realm of his rulership, of being Lord, uh, and there are rules and regulations that he's given us um, as his servants. So, you know. But he is the Holy Spirit's living in us and guiding right. us and directing us. It's not some kind of uh, outside rules being imposed on us, nor is Jesus in the sense that they have it, that his millennial reign is, is going now and inside of us. That's yet right. to come. So, Right. Agreed. Gary, Gabe, questions? Well, you know, it's not on your list here. Well, well ask I'm I'm kind of curious. You you end up talking about uh, the intermediate state and the eternal state. Um, you briefly looked at: are there, is there any such thing as an intermediate body? Um, maybe we could talk about that a little bit. What is the intermediate state like? And then let's talk about a little bit about eternity because I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, you know, it is a bit of a question as to um, if we died right now and, and it, Jesus didn't come back and we uh, go to be with him via death, uh, the question is, would we be disembodied and or are we given um, temporary housing, so to speak? And, um, you know, like the that. embassy suites. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the question sort of revolves around Moses at the transfiguration as to what, what did the disciples see 
there on the Mount of Transfiguration when they saw Moses. You know, Elijah, you know, he was taken bodily to heaven, so he, mm. he doesn't count in this yeah. one. Yeah. But, but Moses, pre, pre-resurrection, pre there he is in some sort of bodily form. Well, you know, you can't build a total theology off of that, but it does raise the question as to whether or not Moses was um, uh, given some sort of temporary body. Uh, others point out that the souls under the altar were given robes. We well, do oh, yeah. you give robes to disembodied uh, yeah. spirits or not? That I don't know. You know, and um, um, my shall not the the Lord of the earth do right? You know, so yeah. whatever's best for us is going to be the case. Yeah. Eternity, you know, um, yeah, I believe is on after the millennial kingdom. Jesus, according to Paul, had. 1 Corinthians 15, turns ruling authority back to the Father, and the Trinity rules, but um, uh, we're in a new heaven and a new earth. And I believe that uh, each, the eternal kingdom of God is is focused here on a new earth. Uh, we are going back to Eden. Um, plan A was really quite good uh, yeah. back in Genesis 1 and 2. And so um, we have resurrection bodies. Um, when I was a kid, uh, nobody would really tell me what we were going to be doing and what was going to be it's going to be like. And but when you look at uh, Revelation twenty one, uh, why is God creating a new earth? And I think mm. it's because He's going back to restore everything that was lost in Eden, uh, material bodies, a paradise. This was all God's idea the ability to enjoy what he had created with our senses. This is God's idea. And now Adam and Eve, who used to um, fellowship with God in the cool of the day, Revelation tells us that God is going to come down and dwell amongst us. We're going to see his face, a full, unhindered fellowship. The, the issue of sin is no longer there. There's no hindrances at all. And so, uh, we have an enhanced version of Eden that's going to be taking place, I believe. Um, full fellowship. Uh, there is going to be, act, uh, you know, all kinds of things going on. The fact that there are kings and nations in the eternal state tells us that um, uh, probably what happens at the judgment seat of Christ um, carries over not just through the millennial kingdom, but into eternity as well. Uh, when Paul talked about the reason why he gave up so much and so on, suffered so much, was the eternal weight of glory. And he mm -hmm. uses the word eternal. And you kind of wonder, um, this seems to be an uh, unending type of an experience. And so we have a, an amazing future. But I think it's helpful to me when I think of eternity, uh, because basically I got the idea from my Sunday school teacher, bless her heart, that, uh, you know, when she said, won't it be wonderful to be with Jesus forever in heaven? Well, I was a junior age boy. Um, of the options that I knew about, that one was the best one. Yeah. Um, you know, heaven and hell, heaven would be better. But the whole idea of an, e of an eternal church service, you know, was just <laughs> not to, to my liking at all. And we get up there and we get a big, thick hymnal and we start with hymn one, one. singing all the verses. All the way through. <laughs> <laughs> If Gabe has to go. Yeah. So we're out of time, Marker. What I'm going to suggest is that we come back. I have 20 more questions to ask. So can we schedule another time where we pick up where we left off? Would that be okay? Dr. So okay. okay with me. Okay. Gabe has somewhere he has to run to. We want to thank you for joining yes. us. I do have one more question sure. before I let you go. Who is the Antichrist? Is it Bill Clinton or is it Barack Obama? I, That's a joke. I, I favor Henry Kissinger. So he's getting <laughs> Henry It's your old school. Your old school. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. So we yeah. want to thank you for appearing with us. Yep. And uh, we know that you have a website that people can go to, and we will attach some of that information to it. And I'll call you tomorrow and schedule another date where we can finish out our going through. It, we knew it was going to be rushed, yeah. but because we got on late. It's gone so long. So yeah. well, yeah. and the book is so comprehensive. Oh yeah. Like I said, I just 
covers everything. And yeah. let me tell you, you we, we, we kind of bounce these questions right off of you. Thank you for sticking with us. These quick paced questions. You answered every single one greatly. And I, I appreciate your time <laughs> in doing that. So I'll, I'll email you and, and try to come up with another, another date okay. where we can do the second half. Yeah. Okay. All so right. we want, we want to thank you. you absolutely. For joining us. We want to say God is great because he's enriched our lives with getting to know you for this little bit of time. And we know from all the testimony of other people that know you, that you are a godly man that's given your life to serve the Lord graciously in his church. So we thank him for that. And thank you for joining us and God bless you. And the gentlemen all say, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Book Podcast. If you liked what you heard and want to support us, like, follow, subscribe on any podcasting platform, on YouTube, on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Simply type in at Hear the Book Pod, at Hear the Book Pod. Thank you. See you next time.